How about telling us that story that you were sharing with Mayor Young, <laughs> Ambassador Young? <laughs> Should I call him ambassador or mayor at all points, or could I, Andy, I call him Andy you, once in a while? Whatever you're okay. comfortable calling. Okay. <laughs> the um, the eight years leading up to to Andy, of course, I know you'd want to know a lot about them. And in some ways, to put what I'm saying in context, you almost have to envision uh, how tumultuous things have been with the business community um, during much of Maynard Jackson's eight years, and. It was a truly symbolic act on the part of uh, Mayor Young to decide that almost before he took his seat in City Hall for the first time as mayor, that he would call, as I think he says, about 80 different um, business chieftains uh, with the help of um, Roberto Gozueta and uh, Charlie Loudermilk to uh, meet with him so that he could explain to them something that we would come to hear endlessly in his administration, and that was, I won once without you. I can probably be reelected without you, but I can't really govern effectively either time without your support. And while that is not an exact synonym for the Atlanta way, I think it probably puts it as crystally clear as almost anything could, and that is you identify uh, what you have in common, and decide that you're going to work for the common good. And one of the things that obviously the mayor and those businessmen had in, co in common was that collectively they all wanted what was best for the um, survival and advancement of the city of Atlanta. And I think in a way that's almost a description of what the Atlanta way is, leaving those things at the edges that really are not as material to those core things that combine you or that un unite you. And um, it was covered hugely on the evening news. I think it led probably the major article in the paper the next morning um, and set once again, as the mayor had done in his campaign, the fact that the, um, the benefit of the city was what guided him, what propelled him, and that he thought that people of goodwill on all sides would join him in that effort. And I think without having set that kind of standard and without then having lived it, it wasn't just talking the talk, but walking the walk, as they say, that we probably would not have gotten the uh, Democratic Convention to, to be the first, first city to hold it in the Deep South ever. And I don't need my geography corrected. I know Miami held it, but we don't consider that the South. Uh, not in that sense. They didn't think they had gone to a Southern city. So Atlanta was the first truly southern city to hold the either of the major conventions. And, and without a doubt, there, there is just no arguing that we would not have been chosen uh, for many other things, and perhaps um, uh, most significantly the, the Olympics in 1996, when the business community and the mayor had to jointly decide how we were going to strive for that. Um, so. The mayor came in setting that as an example, and I think he didn't have to give any of us any marching orders after that or any agendas. Um, it was pretty clear that we were to, to park some of the things that had separated us in the previous administration and to um, make sure that the Atlanta Way was what guided us through everything that we were doing. And when the mayor would be away in pursuit of the Atlanta bid and Shirley Franklin, and I were kind of the two highest ranking officials left in the, in the city when he would be in the, in the wilds of wherever <laughs> getting those votes, um, we always knew whatever the crisis was, that, that was, those were our marching orders. That was the way we were supposed to solve it. Something that I had not thought of in ages just occurred to me as I was parking, as a matter of fact. Another pr true illustration of how the mayor brought that to the table, not just talking, but walking that walk as well was uh, to fast forward a most incredibly kind of ironic coming together of stories occurred, I guess, about halfway through his eight years, I think, maybe mid, uh, midway, the terms, the two terms. Um, of all people, Alice and Julian Bond, and of course Julian Bond was so identified with uh, Andy and those in the movement, and re a revered person in town, um, and he had lost to John Lewis, quite surprisingly, 
but the the essence of why that came to rest on the, all came to rest on the mayor's desk was that there had been some disruption in their marriage and um, uh, some accusations were made and some policemen got involved and before you knew it it had blown up all out of proportion and it come to the attention of the U.S. attorney and other things and before we could even get to those outside issues there were the questions of how policemen had conducted themselves when Alice Young, Alice uh, Bond had gone down from the initial interview to the three or four weeks or so of behavior after that. And it had the city almost at fever pitch. I mean, the headlines were yay big in the paper about the internal investigations and the internal um, uh, uh, hearings and so forth, administrative hearings that were going on. And one day, someone came to me who wanted great anonymity and said that he had a friend who was a lawyer who had grown up with him way up in Cobb County, and they were kind of country boys. And he came to me with a proposition for how to resolve this. And it was so far-fetched, and I thought, he said, we want you to take this to the mayor, because from what he says and how he conducts himself, we believe that he might accept this. People were threatening lawsuits, it was a pending U.S. attorney thing, and, and just, you know, everything was totally, it had become a cropper. And he explained to me what he wanted, and I met with the mayor very early at his home and explained it. And Andy basically said, that would be the Atlanta way. I am very glad. And, and it was, it was um, the idea thank you, was that no matter what side of the table you had taken, no matter how sharply you had sharpened your sword or your axe for the battle, that there was one thing that united everyone who was caught up in that mess, and that was a deep love for the city of Atlanta and a desire to see it not, not harmed even by that. And so the suggestion was that if the mayor, given the position of influence and the reverence that people have for him, would call everyone together and have them go into a room, a big hotel room, a suite at the hotel. And the Hilton often made a huge suite available to us for city meetings when we needed to get away but couldn't afford to go out of town. And uh, the idea was that everyone was going to be put in that room, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whoever had an issue, whoever was directly involved, remotely involved, or was being quoted on television, the radio, and the idea was that the mayor would sit and he would listen to all of them and they would talk until the cows came home. And then at the end of it, the mayor said, your order is, and it lasted about eight or nine hours, and everyone was there. And the mayor never moved. Water was brought, some sandwiches were brought. And at the end of it, his command was that no one was ever to talk about this or to be quoted about this again. And it is still absolutely mind-boggling to me that in the wave of a hand, almost, all the lawsuits were withdrawn, dismissed, all the personnel actions and accusations that people had made against each other and had gone to the federal judge who was overseeing the policemen and the firefighting mess of many generations were all withdrawn. And not one day since that time, has ever, anyone ever been quoted in the paper about a mess that had gotten totally out of control? And it was because those people knew that that was the way that Andy was projecting himself as a person who was willing. And the other thing that was very important about it was that he was willing to think outside the box about solving problems. He never accepted for me when I came as the city attorney with options A, B, and C that there really wasn't a little bit of B that could be added to A that could be added to C that made a new way forward, <laughs> the Atlanta way, if you will. And sometimes, after I had been up all night trying to figure all the cases I had read, the best analysis of them and the best three options I, had, I knew anyone could ever have, that he would come up with one that I had not thought about that was not quite that but was something that was perfect for this city. Um, and that was very much what it was, what it was like to work with Andy for those eight years. There was always something um, that propelled him to find a different way and a way that was uniquely suited, I think, to this city. 
And so um, there, there are many, many, many illustrations, but he set that the first day in office. It did so much for the business community. I remember going in a couple of law firms within the week on different matters, and the senior partners coming out and saying, wow, wonderful, you know, all applauding me as though I had something to do with it. So it, it just set a, a different kind of a tone. And I don't say that at all to um, denigrate or in any way dismiss all the incredible things that, the, that his predecessor did. But it, it did, um, Andy was very good at keeping in front of everyone that there was an Atlanta way to do almost anything and that we were to seek it out. And so that's probably a very long answer to. Uh, Great answer. Uh, but, but that's what, and my challenge as a lawyer, and I used to tell when, when I went into my law firm, became a corporate partner, I used to tell the folks, now there, I'm going to come up with four options overnight, and then as I drive to work, I'm going to think of Andy Young and come up with that fifth one. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I'm an amalgam of all of this. So I'll be back with an answer. <laughs> Uh, and and that's that's one of the things that I just remember just seeing him right now. That that was what he did his first day in office, and and how much um, a goodwill it, it created for all of us in the city, all who worked for him, and I think the entire city. You need to back up. Yeah. I, well, I wanted that that case involved included him going before the grand jury for obstruction of justice. It 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 it, it was yes. It was uh it, it was an outgrowth of that. Mm -hmm. It was an outgrowth of that. Um, that it, it ha the case happened. It has you know the tawdry kind of aspect to it that it, it just brought all of us to tears. Um, that Julian Bond was in a car with uh, an acquaintance of his, and he and Alice, I believe, were already estranged. And she happened to see them, and she followed them. And then there was an altercation outside his mother's house. Um, and apparently that was what propelled her to go down to the uh, police department and share some things with them. And there was a, an inappropriate and unprofessional handling of her from the minute she crossed the threshold of the police department. Um, someone who was in fact off duty, had already checked out and signed off and was in his civvies, as they called it, was going out the door when he recognized her and came back in order to be the one who ginned this all up. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, he knew the black community very well. And um, if you ever talk about leading a witness, mm -hmm. you know, he, he put pictures in front of her of people and asked, isn't he the one? And did a lot of things that were just absolutely not good policing and not very professional. And then as, as that ball tumbled along, it went all through the uh, inappropriate behavior by policemen, the disciplinary hearings of them, and lo and behold, out of all of it, as I was sitting at a city council meeting, um, let's say the first meeting of the month, I looked up and there was a federal marshal's messenger there with a letter for me as the lawyer for Andy Young that they were taking, he, they being Robert Barr, the U.S. attorney, was taking a look at obstruction of justice. And it didn't say that, but I knew that had to be the only possible thing. And the first letter came and it said, I believe it said, subject. You're the subject of an investigation. And you have, <laughs> never forget this. I went across where the old, in the old building and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I have to talk with you about something. And I, he froze and he said, what? And it turned out that the only kernel of anything was that because it was so upsetting to all of us, even my mother and people who didn't know the Bonds very well, but knew his mother. Uh, that whole generation of people, I'm sure, have been on the phone with the mayor saying, can't you do something? It's just not, it's beneath their family ways. And so the mayor, having known all of them since they were kids, I think called Alice and said, you really ought to think about the things you're doing and you know, perhaps this isn't in the best interest of your family and your children. And the U.S. Attorney decided to take that as an obstruction of justice of an ongoing investigation, which had been lobbed over to them as a result of her coming downtown. <laughs> and so he said, the mayor said to me, well, you'll just represent me and you'll tell them so-and-so. And I said, Mr. Mayor, I'm afraid I have to give you maybe good news or bad news. I can't do that. That's really not in your official, you know, performance. And it's not as the mayor. They're going after you personally. Oh, he says... 
well, it doesn't say, and I said, they're not saying come anywhere. We're not, they're just putting us on notice, and I want you to know right away. Two weeks to the day later, same time, same place, I don't know why they couldn't find me in my office, which was with one of the big downtown office buildings. He chose to send them when I was on my most public, the performance of my duties, which was sitting there at the city council meeting. You know, to come up the elevator shaft and come to my office would have garnered no attention. But clearly, with all the press gathered, they're going to want to know who is this marshal serving letters on the city attorney. And so he maxed out on it. And I went back across the way and said, the wording is different. And now this means we have to go into some kind of high gear here. And he said, what do you have in mind? And I said, I have in mind Griffin Bell. Oh, I don't want, no, he says, he'll tell me what to do. I said, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> <laughs> he'll try to tell me. I said, I don't tell you what to do. And so it turned out that uh, that led to a very interesting personal experience. I, Andy was going away. I think he was going to speak at, uh, J at Jacksonville. And so I said, with your permission, I will call him. And he said, okay. So I called him and found him on the golf course down at St. Simons before cell phones. Someone had to march out there and get him, and they marched him back. And I explained it to him, and he said, the flight can get me back there in about 45 minutes. I'll be there in an hour. And uh, that's how that happened, that we wound up uh, getting him. And of course, that was all very successful because there was not one whit of evidence about what they were trying to pursue. It did upset the mayor, though, because we were in uh, Washington about uh, four or five months later, and he became very emotional, saying I did all that to pursue uh, civil rights and to always be on the right side of the law and morality and then to think that someone would use this as a cudgel against me and of course I encourage them there's not a thing to it we'll, we won't we won't have a problem and you know this will be okay but that's exactly what that came out of mm -hmm. um, but that was the only that was the only time in all his years that we even dealt with anything that was um, not a very pleasant memory so but, was this the so was this come to Jesus kind of meeting following the uh, grand jury? Um, it actually was all going on at the same time mm -hmm. because that grand jury matter pen was pending for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And everything that was the subject matter of the Come to Jesus meeting mm -hmm. was city administrative policy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the only other lawsuit that was affected by what we were doing was that on the civil side of things in federal court, the mayor came in inheriting, by that time, about a nine-year-old police and fire promotional litigation that had been going on forever. Since before I had in, Exactly. Right. I had inherited it. And, and, and another kind of illustration of how the mayor th thought outside the box on that was, he said, Marva, there's got to be a way to solve this. And eventually, we worked out some some very inventive ways about how to get books to people and to make sure that people had training and there was no need to cheat on exams. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of the people who were involved in that case be behaved badly, if you will, and became the subject of administrative disciplinary hearings. So the, those, all those things kind of came together. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of them worked out beautifully because uh, the mayor left with the first time in nearly 15 years, police and fire promotional exams having been given, him having the honor and the real pleasure of welcoming the first people who were promoted through promotional exams for going on 20 years, mm -hmm. permanent promotions, or it always had to be interim promotions. Um, and he, he worked with me to make sure that we came up with some very inventive ways to get the federal judge to agree that we could um, give exams. We we went back to the city council a number of times and got uh, consultants and hundreds of thousands of dollars allocated for books to be put in all the precincts, in all the firehouses, and many libraries set up so that people would not have to pay for all the books they would need to really study. Um, and that was another very kind of outside the box way of thinking of doing things. But all of those things worked out worked out beautifully, and I'll never forget it just your dad's, your uh, Mayor Young's ability to come up with a phrase at a moment is just incredible. When the grand jury failed to return an indictment, and the whole press was gathered, and we went back to City Hall, and you know, welcoming him to City Hall with this resounding victory under his uh, under his belt, 
and the, the U.S. attorney had said the grand jury failed to find him, failed to return an indictment. He, he, he used some play on words instead of saying found him innocent. Mm -hmm. And your dad, what was quoted in the paper the next day was, I believe in the American system and there is a presumption of innocence and I prevailed and I am innocent. He refused to use the word innocent. Um, so the, uh, yeah, that was that was uh, mean spirited and, and ended up exactly exactly as it should with with the mayor being victorious once again on all levels. I run into several of the policemen because I was in the room as well. Several of the firefighters and policemen who you can tell are bursting now that this is 20 some years old and they they want to say something about it and they'll say oh no and they'll do this which means hear hear nothing see nothing. <laughs> Say nothing. So they're, they're still under that mandate. <laughs> uh, yeah, that those were things I hadn't thought about in a long time. But yeah, those are some very interesting ways to yeah. Yeah, because I re I remembered some of that, and I I didn't know how it had finally been yeah. resolved. Yes, it was it was resolved, and uh, I saw Griffin Young not long before his passing, and he still rated it as one of the most interesting experiences because he got to. Um, in setting up what might be a potentially a defense for the mayor, he got to meet all these people who were legendary civil rights folks who I had lined up to be character witnesses if we need, needed them. And he just truly enjoyed getting to know everybody uh, on a one-on-one one -on -one basis like that. And he did, he was at he, he, he was at King and Spalding, King and, Spalding right? and he, he was the former attorney general, right. U.S. Attorney General, former Chief Judge of the Fifth Circuit, and I knew that we needed someone like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, mm -hmm. no camp who had someone like that available would fail to take him off the bench. He was on our bench, so to speak, you know, for our team. And um, it was it was quite an interesting, um, quite. A, and for me, I had never dealt with him on. I had never dealt with him professionally. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite interesting to see how a, a man of his generation kind of you know practiced mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. So. And he uh, and they did this pro bono. He did, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my call, you know, mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. that uh, I would do it, you know, with all my heart if I could. But the citizenry, I think, those who might not have elected the mayor would wonder why am I his personal lawyer? Mm -hmm. um, although it was tempting to say I didn't see the conflict and do it, I knew that would then be mm -hmm. part of the hullabaloo, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I worked with him night and day. I was along with him on every single interview and did everything because your dad really wanted me, really wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. So um, you would only have bits and pieces of that because you were away at school, yeah. right? And, well, or, or in Washington. I was away, right. You were working in Washington. Washington. Yeah. Yep. Father goes before the grand jury. You know, you it, it, it tends to come up. Yeah, it <laughs> tends to come up. And yeah, and what, what was that about? Yeah. yeah. And I remember going to meet with your mom and explaining her in detail everything that was going on, and she felt very comfortable about it. I mm -hmm. said, there is not one sliver of evidence to support it, and we will mm -hmm. make sure that you know nothing comes of it. So that was a, uh, we could have done without that, but it all also came out beautifully, turned mm -hmm. out perfectly. Well, you want to go back to the beginning? Well, yes. One of the we always like to find out sort of how people decided to come to Atlanta, how you started your career in Atlanta. Two, I can tell the short version of it. Because I I went to Howard at a time when lots of professors and folks used to vacation at uh, Martha's Vineyard. And I babysat at Martha's Vineyard, and then as soon as I got to be a lawyer and could afford to pay my way and vacation there, I vacationed there part of every August. And I was there in 1973 when this man who was running for mayor of Atlanta came through. And we had a lot of mutual friends, but we didn't know each other. And um, I had just recently graduated from law school, three, four, four or five years earlier. And um, he was up because one of the traditions is for politicians of all stripes in all parts of the country to go to Martha's Vineyard because it's a great gathering of Democrats and it's a great gathering of black folks from everywhere. And there's a lot of fundraising that goes on there. So Maynard came up, he was running for mayor in 1973 and he met me and someone had given him a little bit of information about me. And he came over to me and he said, I'm offering you a job, I want you to come and practice law with me in Atlanta. I said, 
oh, okay. I mean, what, what, what job do you have in mind? I thought he meant maybe his law firm. He said, no, when I'm elected, I want you to come and be special counsel to the mayor. And I thought to myself, he's not elected. <laughs> he can't be serious. And I thought it was pretty much a joke. And you know, we kind of went back and forth. I'd see him another day or so, and he said, hey, counselor. And sure enough, Maynard gets elected, and within a day or two, he calls me up and he says, I want you to come and be special counsel to me. I've got some things I want to do, and I believe you might be the first person you know that I should talk to about doing that. And sure enough, he was serious. And a couple, about four or five months later, we relocated from Brooklyn. My husband and I often look at each other when we go back to the street we lived on. This beautiful brownstone, lovely street, Brooklyn Heights overlooking Wall Street. Mm. And we would say to each other, "Now, whose idea was it? <laughs> whose idea was it to leave this beautiful street and this beautiful neighborhood called Brooklyn Heights?" But my husband dutifully followed. We up, we uprooted everyone. We came to Atlanta, and sure enough, I kept thinking, you know, it's a joke. He's not going to have the job. And yeah, he, I, I became, I became a special counsel to the mayor. And it turns out that one of the things that he had in mind for me was to figure out how we were going to increase minority participation in um, airport, in in uh, city contracting. And I thought. Mm, now, what law course can I go back to? What would be my resource materials on this? You know, you go back to your notes or something. Mm -hmm. And I found there were none. <laughs> <laughs> it was a complete blank slate. Um, and I wound up getting here in March, February or March. So he had just been in office two, couple of months. And one of the first things that had happened when Maynard Jackson became mayor was one of his supporters had passed something that took the name the Finley Ordinance mm -hmm. after the Councilman Morris Finley. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty generic, uh, pretty generic, almost word for word kind of tracking of the federal uh, Title VII for employment. Um, and it was kind of, if you will, it was kind of an amalgam uh, an amalgamation of two basic things. The, th there had been, unbeknownst to a lot of people, uh, President Nixon had issued an executive order. Mm -hmm. And someone who had written that uh, Finley Ordinance had gone and picked a few things out of that and a few things out of Title VII and put it together. And I don't think there's any argument that can be made that it was primarily for employment. It was to get those who were contracting with the city to tell the city who they had employed and to disclose along ethnicity, race, gender. Um, and so I created all the forms for the implementation of that ordinance. But it was very restrictive. And initially I thought that the mayor wanted to make sure that all contract that the, that he heightened awareness in Atlanta about the need to employ with diversity as your aim, and that uh, if that were done successfully, that's where he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Until it started dawning upon me that he really had something quite <laughs> quite different in mind, and I guess I'll never forget the irony of it. Uh, I was not a commissioner of a special counsel in the mayor's office, and one of the few um, African American commissioners at the time, when I guess when Maynard uh, took over one of his first appointments, was Emma Darnell, mm -hmm. who now is a commissioner at uh, Fulton County, but she was the first black female to have a cabinet level position. And the mayor had, I think, found her in a slightly different position in city government, and he had elevated her to a cabinet. And so it was under, un, one of the bureaus under her was purchasing. She was the commissioner, I think, of administrative services, and so she had purchasing under her belt. And so the, the only way to really implement that ordinance that was on the books was to have it somehow or other attached to purchasing documents, to bidding documents and proposals and submissions. So she was the, the cabinet member who was um, tasked with a bureau who was to do that. One of the mo most ironic things I think of my life is that um, 
on a Sunday night before a huge meeting on Monday, the mayor was now going to be telling people engaged in the biggest project the city had underway when Maynard became the uh, mayor, and that was the so-called Midfield Atlanta Airport Complex Project. That's a mouthful to say something that as a young person, I had no idea how innovative it all was because I, I had found out you know, in the course of um, learning that the mayor had more than just employment in mind, that there was this big project, and the uniqueness of it was that he wasn't going to tear down or stop one airport. They were just going to go out in the midfield of that one and do some very creative things uh, about the interstates that came by and that were an impediment and so forth. So the day came when Emma Darnell, as commissioner, was supposed to meet with the long, long, long time architecture and engineering firms. I, I don't want to stretch the point, but I think maybe some of those companies had had five and six year contracts already working on the midfield project and not one spade of earth had been turned. And the commissioner of aviation, the commissioner of purchasing, the commissioner of finance, all those people were engaged in letting those contracts and such as there was an ongoing project that was at that level. So the mayor called, was calling them all together and Commissioner Darnell was supposed to explain what they wanted when her uncle died in Alabama and I got a call at home late Sunday night that the, she couldn't make it and I was supposed to go. And I said, well, you know, being a type A person and wanting to do a little homework, what, what exactly, where can I read? What, what case can I go read? What am I supposed to tell them? But, oh, you'll be fine. She said, call, call Maynard up and he'll explain it to you. And I called him up and he had somebody the kid that had a dinner party or something that Sunday night. I was supposed to meet with him early that morning and I think the Queen of Belgium or somebody came in. <laughs> and so I never had any chance to get briefed. And suddenly the bell rang, the door opened up and the meeting started. And the mayor was telling the people who were responsible for this huge thing, which it, as, as, at its fullness, as you might have heard, was the biggest thing that ever, ever happened in the public works arena in, uh, in Georgia. And he told them that it wasn't going forward if they did not have minority participation. And by the way, uh, Councillor Brooks, if you will give them your cards, I'm sure their lawyers are going to have a lot of questions about this. And so I, you know, very timidly passed out my cards, and um, uh, the meeting ended. We, somebody else was coming in. We went out in the hallway, and the men began to ask me. They were all men. They began to ask me, "What did the mayor had in mind? What did the mayor have in mind?" And I began to have to go real fast <laughs> to try to make sense of what I had I had heard. They thought that if they just hired some architects and some engineers because they had no minorities, no females on their, on, on their payrolls and those, and those skills, that that would meet what the mayor had in mind. And I said, I don't think so. I think we're talking here about engaging minority-owned companies and doing joint ventures and engaging people in an ownership level. And um, thereupon began the great second battle of Atlanta. <laughs> it was as though Sherman had come back through town <laughs> because it rocked and rolled for months. No, nothing, you know, and all the technical people said the time has come that if there's to be an unveiling of this in September of 1980 or July 1980, this must be done today. And, you know, engineers and architects had all the beautiful things to show how much time was being lost. And the mayor shut down the project entirely, refused to even let those people lift another pin in the engineering design, pre-prep work, site work, or anything. And that was a stalemate that lasted for several months, several months. And finally, there came a day when Everyone in Atlanta, editorial, writing about it every day for months, two and three inch headlines. The Urban League came to town during the summer and that ginned it up even more because they all thought, what a wonderful thing the mayor's doing and it took, took the word all over the country. My phone would ring on a Monday morning and I knew when I got a call from 
Seattle, Washington, and Mitt Maynard had been out there that weekend telling people to call me about it and so forth. The long and short of it was that I, I was able to look back at this thing called the Finley Ordinance and see in it a potential interpretation for how those who could not meet the employment requirements of that ordinance could be asked to submit an affirmative action plan and that would remedy that. And one of the options that you could have for remedying that would be that while you beefed up your employment, you would engage minority engineers, minority businesses. And so that was the way we were able to put, in a way, the camel through the eye of a needle back into this fairly narrow ordinance and make it work. And it still kind of amazes me that something as huge as that in its origin and for about six years was bottomed on that legal structure. Um, the town and Maynard were at cross swords and it was rancorous and mean-spirited and it was a really painful time um, to be in City Hall and to be associated with the mayor if you were at a dinner party <laughs> or <laughs> other places in mixed company. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was warring camps. The city was absolutely into warring camps. There was nobody in the middle. And that went through the black community and the white community because there were some people of my mother's generation and them who thought this is going too far hmm. or too fast. Hmm. And so it, it was like civil wars in homes and definitely between the north side and the south side of Atlanta, it was like the second civil war. And I'm, I'm really happy to say that even there, I think, in the end, Atlanta way, if you will, is what, is, is what prevailed. Very similar to what your dad did, your, the, the mayor did, um, in his first day. Some Atlantans came forth from the business community and suggested that everyone tied up in this battle was united by one thing that was very large, and that is that they loved the city of Atlanta and they did not want to lose federal funds that were assigned and earmarked for this project that we might stand the chance of losing. And that we didn't want the further, it was in the New York Times, Time Magazine, it was huge. And some people came, some uh, hiring partners, senior partners and law firms visited me. Uh, people visited the mayor and suggested that 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 that, the United, that united us was larger than what separated us and we needed an evening meeting. Kind of like everybody get together, nobody ever speak of this again. Uh, years before your, 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 the Mayor Young came. And it, that's exactly what happened. A huge meeting with, at the Hardin Construction Company, one of the leading families in the construction industry in Atlanta, uh, set up a meeting and the idea was that if it took all day and all night, they were prepared to serve us dinner, um, breakfast in the morning, grits were ordered, <laughs> and cots would be available. Um, and we went into this room, and the table was about this, about this big, about this size. There were about 17 people from the construction industry, the law firms, and the business community of Atlanta. And on this side sat Mayor Jackson, his chief administrative officer, and me. Mm. <laughs> and um, the things, things went on for about 30, 40 minutes, and the mayor leaned over to me and said he was ill. And I thought he was kidding until he got up and went to the men's room and came back and leaned over again and said, I'm ill and can't go on. And I, I think my life passed me. <laughs> my life passed before me. <laughs> I think I was about 28 or 29 years. <laughs> 28 or 29 years old. Any three people across the table were older than me. <laughs> you know, three times older. Any any person across the table was three times older than me. The other person who was in the room, and it was very very interesting, was very new to Atlanta and did not have a to me, a real sense of how things were done in Atlanta. Um, it, an hour, good hour, before we even sat down, before Maynard got to this point, had been spent standing around talking about schools and what football 
teams because I think it was in the fall of the year and who was playing who and you know how we do and how how's your grandbaby and <laughs> Tennessee's going to be Vanderbilt and this person had come from New York City and didn't have a clue. Is this Jules Freeman? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And he just kept wanting to get to the business. He kept wanting to get to the business. <laughs> And uh, even when Maynard was there, he kept wanting to do that and, and converting what was a, well, Morehouse beat Clark this weekend <laughs> kind of opportunity into the business. And believe it or not, we got, you know, a lot done in that first 30 minutes when Maynard let them know that he was the mayor of all the people. And he believed that there were things that did unite us. But he got ill and left that meeting. And I think... I probably matured about 20 years, <laughs> or aged about 20 years. And one thing that struck me was that maybe in, in, in New York that was a negotiating way, but in Atlanta, the Atlanta way was not meant for you to give away everything. I mean, there were principles that you did stand on. We were not there to just compromise on everything. And it left me in a very interesting position of having to say after a summary had been made of what the, he, someone, what Jewel thought that meeting had produced, that I didn't agree with it, almost any of it. And um, somehow or other that uh, we were going to have to reconvene and get back together. It turns out, though, that we never had to recon reconvene. We had established enough things that we could, I could talk to their lawyers about. And we did, you know we did finally resolve the matter and, and move forward and the rest is history and it still now amazes me when I come through Atlanta that it's Hartsfield Jackson <laughs> International <laughs> Airport and the standoff that Maynard Jackson had and all the psychic energy and, and life force that he put into that airport truly justifies it being named for him. Mm -hmm. there, there, it boggles my mind to think of the things that he might also have done had he not had to put all of that mm -hmm. into the into the airport. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a sad, there's a really a kind of a sad aspect to that. And your dad asked me to remember, you know, I mean, Mayor Young asked me to remember to say this, and that was how he was boycotted in the end. Um, it always struck me as just the height of, of unfairness that even though I was the one who often had to go to the lawyers for different businesses and say that uh, Mayor Jackson's position was X, Y, and Z, and it was against their position, when it came time for me to uh, leave and you know go into the private sector, that was not held against me. In fact, I had an abundance of offers from different law firms, and yet they boycotted. Um, Every law firm in Atlanta boycotted Mayor Jackson and would not allow, would not make an offer to him, which is almost unheard of, for an outgoing, um, high-ranking government official not to be made an offer to some law firm. And he had to get, wound up going to Chicago, where a firm there took him on, and he became a bond counselor and bond lawyer. And then they allowed him to open up a, an Atlanta office so he could come back and reestablish residency. Here. So that event just for, just shadowed, overshadowed almost everything that he did. Fortunately, by the time he came back for the third of his terms that were interspersed by Mayor Young's eight years, that had all been pretty much forgiven. Um, but still, there were there were lingering hard feelings about that. I think for maybe his entire life. Mm -hmm. And it was fairly, it was really unfair. And it, it also struck me when he passed that some people who were taking out headlines, headlines and announcements, were the people who were the most intractable mm -hmm. and the hardest people to deal with. Mm -hmm. But um, it, was, it was really quite a struggle. When I wound up coming to Atlanta, I think I was not prepared for how little progress, because that was 73, so I came in 74. I was not prepared for how little progress they had actually been in the city. Mm. Having been a student in the Civil Rights Movement, I guess I expected the eight, ten years since the Civil Rights Act had passed that we would be much farther along, and, and we really weren't. It was still very much old Atlanta. Um, it struck me, I remember, when after I got here and got, got involved in things, and someone said, you know, when Martin Luther King won the Nobel Prize, 
there was not going to be a hometown banquet for him, which apparently in the world of Nobel Prize recipients is unheard of. Right. Wherever you're from, the village elders you know, host a favorite son. And they were not going to do that in Atlanta until someone decided that it was unseemly for a native son to win the Nobel Prize and for them not to have an integrated ballroom of people in a hotel in Atlanta. And I remember when I was hearing it, that that meant, and, and it did happen, and I remember when I was hearing it, how awestruck I was. That had been only eight years before, mm -hmm. and that was the first time in Atlanta's history that blacks and whites sat together in a ballroom. Mm -hmm. And it, in a way, it was a very informative, it was very, very useful information for me, because then I could figure if that only happened eight years ago, then the fact that the town was not ready to accept what Maynard was doing in minority participation became a lot more understandable. <laughs> I mean, th th that was quite a leap, mm -hmm. you know, from we're not even going to sit together with black people in Atlanta to honor Martin Luther King to we have a black mayor and oh yes, we're willing to cut the economic pie with you. Um, but much to its credit, once it was established that that was going to be the way things were done in Atlanta, Atlantans fell in and I think that whole idea of Atlanta maximizing opportunities for diversity everywhere just began to take, out, take off all over town. And uh, for me, I always think of this as a, a real interesting um, illustration of that. By the time Mayor Young had become the mayor, and the Olympics were in, came to town. Several people who had been high-ranking people with either the Jackson or the Jackson and Young administrations were asked to go over to the Olympics to perform the same jobs. The Commissioner of Finance, uh, Shirley Franklin as the Chief Administrative Officer, me as the City Attorney going over to become Olymp the, the Olympics Attorney, and the, many, many other people police officers over running security operations. And what that meant was that you had folks who came from the Atlanta tradition, the Atlanta way, if you will, now joining with people, many of whom were new to town and had no idea that Atlantans would expect an operation of that magnitude to be the most diversified Olympics the world had ever seen, that diversity would reign. And you could see at a meeting with Billy Payne, let's say, that someone who had just arrived from California and didn't know how we did things in Atlanta might not yet have a very well diversified staff, but within about three or four months, they would have said, oh, that's the way they do in Atlanta. And I submit to you that as a result of that, Atlanta probably had the most diverse Atlanta uh, uh, Olympic organizing committee personnel that the world has ever seen or might ever see. <laughs> I mean, it's just a real illustration. Of course, your dad, Mayor Young, was there, um, and everyone knew that that was the way we did in Atlanta. And he had, to, he had to say almost nothing to get that done because the people who had worked for him in the city and the other people who studied and found out how things were done in Atlanta. So, yeah, that's how I arrived in Atlanta. And that's the state of affairs that I found when I arrived, and it was a little shocking, and then it was just amazing to see what leaps and bounds we had made in a fairly short time. So you had come from New York. Is I come from you? New York. I come from New York. Um, I'm from Western Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I'm from near the Pittsburgh area. I'd gone mm -hmm. to Howard undergrad, Harvard Law School, had done the obligatory trek back to Wall Street from Harvard Law School, and then ran into Maynard, mm -hmm. came to Atlanta, was a special counsel, and then Maynard asked me, appointed me to be city attorney. Mm -hmm. So I, I served him for about a year and a half or two as special counsel to the mayor, mm -hmm. about two years as m city attorney. And then when Mayor Jackson, Mayor Young came to town, he found me there as Maynard's city attorney who was mm -hmm. still, still serving out a portion of my term. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all submitted our resignation letters and that's just what's done in, at, at that level of government. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mayor Young asked me, said that he wanted to reappoint me and mm -hmm. to retain me in that position. And so I wound up, shockingly to him and me, serving him his entire eight years. Mm -hmm. 
and learning something every day <laughs> about a new and inventive way to, <laughs> to deal with a problem. One day, Mayor Young said to me, when I was on my way to go, one of our more colorful police officers had sued him and Mrs. Young personally in some administrative personnel dispute about promoting him. And he had gotten some lawyer who had named the mayor personally, Mrs. Young personally, and in his official capacity. And I was in the mayor's office explaining that I had a hearing that afternoon, and it was with him and this particular police officer and what he wanted. And he stood up and hugged me, as he often did, as I was going out to go to court or something. And he said, now, Marva, just remember one thing. You might win this case tonight, but I'm still going to love this police officer in the morning. And I said, Mr. Mayor, that's not fair to send me out with <laughs> that's conflicted, <laughs> conflicted emotions. <laughs> Am I supposed to beat his butt or not? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Am I supposed to win <laughs> or what? And he said, win lovingly. I said, I'll try. <laughs> But I want you to know, my very main motive is winning <laughs> to protect your purse <laughs> and your mayoralty and your children's inheritance. <laughs> right. Uh, but th that was the, that, and he used, used to say to me very often in cases and that, um, can I have them over to my house for gumbo? Just them and me without any lawyers? And I said, no, I don't think you can. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think the judge would approve of that. But anyway, yeah, that's my history of coming here, working with Maynard on that, inheriting that when I became the city attorney, still on the hot seat for that, and then you know, finding myself, surprisingly, being Mayor uh, Young's lawyer for the entire eight years that he was a... Members of his family used to threaten me that if I left, <laughs> they were... They weren't going to be happy. Like his mother. <laughs> they want, they, like his mother. He would send his mother <laughs> to talk to me about never leaving him. And his sister-in-law played tennis with me, and every weekend she would tell me, don't leave him. Uh, and I wound up having such a good time that I, I was that boggled my mind that I enjoyed it so much that I stayed with him his entire time as the uh, as and the it mayor. It certainly wasn't for the big paycheck. No, it wasn't for the big check, <laughs> paycheck. That, that, got delayed, that got delayed a little bit. But as my husband kept saying, well, where can you buy an experience like this? Good. Well, <laughs> and I we think appreciate that. that. I think that was absolutely, that was absolutely <laughs> the case. Absolutely. The, the, the people I met who were not connected with City Hall, who were Atlantans, was just... Really, an incredible experience. I, I used to often think back that if I had stayed in Atlanta, I'd never. I'd stayed in New York. I never would have had an experience quite like that. You know, um, at such a young age, mm -hmm. being at, at the seats of power and learning all these, learning mm -hmm. to know all these people personally, um, and being young and being not only African American, but hardly there were hardly ever any women. Almost no, almost no women, almost no women. No blacks, no women, and no one my age, um, and yet enjoying the you know the full confidence of uh, the mayor to um, to go off and, and do things like that was quite was quite an amazing quite an amazing experience, and because of the reputation of both Maynard and the mayor Young, I, I think it increased it it increased your credibility your credibility because people had such high regard for them that they couldn't imagine that they were not sending someone who was on top of their game. And that, in turn, propelled you to stay up all night if you had to, to do three propositions and three options and a fourth one, possibly, as you drove in. <laughs> drove in. I mean, it was just kind of a self-serving, if you will, self-fulfilling. I, I trust you. I mean, the mayor often said to Shirley Franklin and me, uh, I trust the two of you when you get together. You are guided by how we do things, how I want things done, that he did not have to give us a blueprint for absolutely everything because it was just an overarching kind of, um, you know, light motif, if you will, a kind of guide, guiding light of how we were supposed to do, to do things. But it did, it did shake some old timers to their roots to think that they weren't dealing with someone who was 60 years old, or, you know, and uh, female or, or male and, and, and white. Um, but that's, that's it, it, Atlanta was, as I say, in 1974-75, it's hard to describe how much more uh, 
progress we've made si mm -hmm. since then, mm -hmm. because we were not very far from the era of the civil of the civil rights um, mm -hmm. movement. <coughs> Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when Shirley Franklin was elected mayor, mm -hmm. she turned to you to solve a crisis. <laughs> Could you say a little bit about that role in working with her on the new ethics policy? You know, Shirley Franklin and I are such good friends that sometimes when people ask me how many mayors that I work with, I say two. Because I still, uh, because I don't, I don't count her, but I, but I should. Shirley and I wound up not work. Well, Shirley and I wound up working together actually in three major ways. She was a commission. She was the chief administrative officer when I was a city attorney. As your father predicted would be the case, we once went one night to your home saying, "Mayor Young, we're concerned about X, Y, and Z at the Olympics," and he would say. Oh, the two of you will get together and you'll figure out a way to do it or you'll bring people away uh, along your way and they'll understand how we do it in Atlanta. And that turned out to be true. And then the mayor, Shirley Franklin ran for mayor. <clears throat> the first problem, I'm not sure if someone was referring to this or not, but the first problem, I became counsel for Shirley Franklin's uh, re-election for her campaign. And... Um, there was a challenge to the vote count that night. And um, Rob Pitts was her opponent, her major opponent, as you might remember. And we had to wind up going to court to a hearing, and I had the pleasure of being the first one to call her and say that that had been favorably um, adjudicated, and I was the first one who could call her Madam Mayor. And I remember saying to her, I only want one thing back, Shirley. I want to ride in the mayor limousine, and I want you to be playing Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? <laughs> okay, and we ride around town with that playing, and that will do me fine. You're big bucks. I got no big bucks for this. So that will be, that will be your payoff for me. And immediately, um, almost immediately, there was one thing after another in Shirley's administration where we had to wind up, we, because I engaged a couple of colleagues of mine, a couple of partners, with different ethics challenges. I mean, I think one of them went on about eight years, almost her entire eight years. And we spent enormous amounts of time. Um, Shirley was very comfortable with my way of lawyering. And I used to tell her she probably ought to be, you know, drafting younger people to, you know, grow them up. And she says, no, I don't have to, I have you. <laughs> I said, well, I have other clients, I'm in private practice. But yes, I think she's probably referring to the fact that we had to wind up uh, going to bat for her almost the entire eight years that she was uh, the mayor. I wound up being her campaign lawyer for her two campaigns. And um, any balls that came that weren't technically within, within the purview of the city attorney, the ethics allegations at the um, state level, and anything else that she had to contend with. Didn't you help the task force with the development of the new policy? Oh, oh yes. That's oh what yes. I was oh, oh yes. I, at. Yes, yes, yes. I I was on the uh, and she appointed me and Lawrence Ash to also head up the commission that wound up uh, creating the new ethics uh, code and. Uh, helping to identify someone who would be a good um, ethics officer or the counsel for the ethics commission. And yes, I, I continued to do all that. In fact, when I would see her out socially, I would tell her that she forgot that I was no longer in City Hall. <laughs> because everything that came up, I wound up helping her, helping her do as well. And of course, as I say, the, you know, the middle part of those three experiences was working with her for almost eight years at the Olympics. Because I went over there in 1990. We had not yet won the games, and Shirley came just, I think, a month or two later. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually were there for the entirety of the preparation, and for a year or so afterwards, she was also there as, as I was. That, too, was a very interesting experience, because we wound up working with, as I say, people who had come from other places, but we wound up working with contemporaries of ours in Atlanta that we had no previous dealings with. I probably had the most dealings with the most people because I was a lawyer and had dealt with many of the people who had helped bring the games who were lawyers. So I probably know most of them, 
or more of them than, than most people. But it was the coming together in a desire to put Atlanta's best foot forward and people meeting who maybe would have traveled parallel courses in this town and never really met. And I now consider some of my best friends to be people that I met in those almost eight or ten years that we worked together at the Olympics. And what bound us together was indeed the, the sense that, that Mayor Young gave to all of us as the leader of the Olympics, that we were a special city. It was a special way of doing things here. He made us keenly aware that we might be setting the example in both disabilities, dealing with, for the first time, um, the, the new American with Disabilities Act became effective for the first new big construction project on the Atlant on the Olympic Stadium. Mm. And people had begun to bring those issues to Mayor Young's door because a lot of people don't realize this, but the implementation and enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act was housed in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, meaning a very growing and budding and aggressive um, disability community, disability rights community, viewed Andy Young as their man in the Olympics because of his of his reputation in the civil rights arena. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that Mayor Young could not afford to be involved with a project that was now kind of the new phase of the civil rights movement. If it was housed in the Justice Department in the civil rights uh, division, then people would expect Andy Young to be cognizant of that and a champion for that. And very often, I think even Billy Payne himself would tell you that he was my toughest sell on some of those things because some of those demands were costly. But um, Atlanta wanted to make sure that since that, in a sense, that cup had passed to us to be the first ones to implement that provision on a new construction project of that magnitude, uh, that we had to make sure that, that Andy's um, heading that set an example for meeting those requirements and exceeding them. And the, civil, the, the um, disability rights community considers Andy Young to be one of their civil rights heroes as well because of the support that he gave me on anything that I ever thought really should be done, um, that I needed help anywhere, and particularly perhaps with Billy Payne and others to convince them that we should do that even if it costs more money. And I think that many people could look at the Olympics and the history of it and never get to that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you're the first person to mention it. Mm -hmm. That they, you know, would come to me mm -hmm. and the first time they came and they said, mm -hmm. well, we know Mayor Young. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, all I have on my plate, I'm going to have to give this real special attention, attention also. Mm -hmm. um, but it was expected that he not just barely comply with it and, you know, not grudgingly and not with a lot of rancor. And so we did, and it was very interesting. The night of the games, right after Muhammad Ali lit the torch, um, some areas that we had added beyond even what the law required for companion seating for disabled, I came right up that aisle, and those 10 or 20 people would not have been able to sit there if I hadn't had a meeting with Andy, and he looked at things, and he said, well, I mean, with all this thinking out of the box always, well, if this part of the stadium has this much space and you can put those chairs there, doesn't that look the same? And sure enough, they were almost identical to the eyes of a layman like him and me. And we didn't see any obstruction over here. And we wound up getting them because Andy had said, I would think you could add those as well. And that to me meant do it. And so we did, and I came up, and lo and behold, they were the people who I passed through that night as I was exiting from down below. And I don't think I've ever been hugged and greeted with such love from folks because they were able to see something that they say no one like them had ever been able to see the Olympics like that before. Mm -hmm. Because you otherwise could not have made it to that level mm -hmm. in, in a wheelchair. So, and I don't know if I've ever told, gone back and told your dad mm -hmm. that was my experience that mm -hmm. night, but um, mm 
-hmm. Sometimes this, you know, there's got to be a way out of no way. Mm -hmm. Y'all remember that too, right? Mm -hmm. Would um, make me sit up two or three nights figuring, now how is that way out of mm -hmm. no way? <laughs> I right. see no way. I never mentioned that. But I actually participated, I was on um, Kennedy's staff during some of the work to pass ADA. Right. And then the, um, and it always still, I, sometimes I would go in buildings and say, how old is this building? Why, why exactly. should it still be so difficult? That's exactly you know, why right. Why are you bringing in people, you know, through the service entrance exactly. in a building that's, this recently built? How does exactly. that happen? Exactly. It's kind of the occupational hazard in a way. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know things. I would not have been a corporate lawyer once I left the city. I would have had probably no involvement with the ADA except for a, a corporation that was wanting to fight it. And I probably would have gone back to my office and would have got some employment lawyer because there was no specialty in the area. It was brand new. So people were developing specialties. I would have heard it, probably known very little about it, taken it as far as I could before I sought you know, someone to specialize in it. But having done that, I can't now go out to a restaurant and look and say, I wonder how this is ADA compliant. Right. I wonder how they get away with this. I'll tell you, he's, he's glad about it now. I know. Well, I know. <laughs> He's always looking for the elevator. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I never never remembered, to, I don't think with everything that went on, I've ever really got back to your dad to tell him how just how absolutely a hero. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure they wrote yeah. him letters, but yeah. uh, that, that wound up being a big thing. Yeah. There was so much resistance <clears throat> among people who weren't accustomed to doing things the Atlanta way at right. the Olympics that I was sent to meet with Janet Reno about it. Mm. Because somebody, we won't be profane, but someone used an old, you know, old country expression of how they be be doggone if they weren't going to do something. Uh, he said, "You're going to go talk to Janet Reno. I'm not doing that." Hmm. And so, um, you know, I came back and talked to your dad about it. Talked to Mayor Young and said, "I think we're going to need some educate. We need you to educate somebody about this being the new battlefield and civil rights and so forth and so on." And um, that happened, and then it was clear sailing mm -hmm. after that. But that was something I would think m most of the people at the table, when we met in the mornings at the Olympics, the table was about this size, and I would think except for a periodic report that I might give other than the construction manager, whose life was now impacted in every one of the venues with this, there would have been other people at that table who met with us every morning who would have known nothing about the ADA because it was brand new. Mm -hmm. We won the games in September of 1990, and that law became effective July 1, 1991. And on July 2, 1991, I got a call from the Justice Department saying, hello, <laughs> we are from the Civil Rights Division. <laughs> and I basically said, who, <laughs> what, why? <laughs> And it stunned me to find out that this was going to be the civil rights battle of the Atlanta Olympics. So you had two big battles on you. Had, you you did the joint venture battle, and you had the ADA it, battle. The ADA yeah. battle, exactly, exactly. And Shirley Franklin was uh, kind of part of both of them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really under her purview at the Olympics, except that one of her purposes there was to be the policy advisor and to say, you know, we obviously can't have a reputation <clears throat> for fighting the, this new civil rights group that will be um, disability advocates. Um, so, yeah, that was an another thing your dad, your dad, Mayor Young had to deal with. And of course, I, I'm sure a lot of people mentioned him inheriting the missing and murdered children first day he met with the Chamber of Commerce. We had a cabinet meeting, I think, later that day or the next day, and then the next day I had to meet with him and give him all the details of the missing and murdered children. And he thought, my goodness, what have I gotten, in, what have I gotten in, into here? So there were a lot, a lot of things. And in terms of civil rights, I, I, just the flukiest thing that for someone to be a world-renowned um, uh, leader in civil rights and human rights, and in his mayoralty for us to have perhaps more 
police, civilian death and encounter than any mayor in eight years. It just is unbelievable that we had more civilians um, who were probably shot and killed in police civilian mm. arrest situations. Mm. And that was always very, very, very tough. That was, <clears throat> anytime we got to the point of settling a case, whether it was a death case or an injury, the mayor would always ask me if there wasn't more money in the pot to give them more than they were asking for. Mm. And I would have to say, Mayor Young, are you going to go to the city council meeting with me and explain what that extra $50,000 <laughs> <laughs> $50,000 would be for, and within a lot of times, cases like that, he would say, does this person have a grandmother? And I would say, yes. He said, well, can I have the grandmother come over and I'll make gumbo for her? I would say, they might think that's not right. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask the judge. Okay, well, don't worry about it. You come up with some other way. Always willing to, you know, see the human. And I will never forget, we had a case that lasted forever and a day. And it went back and forth and back and forth. And it was a young boy who had died, I think, in jail. And after being in the district court at the federal level, all the way to the Court of Appeals, back, remanded back for something, appealed back, I think appealed another time. Finally, we had a win. And we only had to pay $56,000 or something like that. And I reported to Mayor Young that that was a win. The victory was now in hand. And he said to me, that's a victory? And I remember being so humbled because we had been so caught up in the battle of, with their lawyers that were mean and rancorous that the law would not have allowed me to pay more than that. Mm -hmm. But I had completely lost track of the fact that some young black boy's life was being valued, you know, devalued. My mission in life was to make sure that they didn't get a penny more. And your dad said to me, that's a victory. Mm -hmm. And so it was really challenging working with someone who was hearing a different drumbeat. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so much fun, I couldn't leave it for eight mm -hmm. years. It sort of gets at something I don't know that we've had a lot of conversation about, and that is his dual perspective as minister and elected public official. It was part of almost everything we did. It was in some way part of almost everything we did, because it was the intersection, when I appeared, it was the intersection of the law and public policy. You know, you might want to do this. And a, I think a perfect illustration of that was the aftermath of the Wayne Williams, <clears throat> and I'm sure it was going on even after his conviction, <clears throat> that came across my desk a claim from his parents that was, in essence, as one of my young lawyers said as he described it, they would describe the case in a cover sheet of a few words to tell me what the claim was about. And I remember looking at the cover sheet, and this particular lawyer was kind of funny, a great sense of humor, and he called it the trashing of Wayne Williams' parents' home. And I thought, what? And I picked it up, and I read it, and I said, well, that's a pretty good description. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a pretty good description. Mm -hmm. um, the inner jurisdictional police force that had been working because that case had gone on for so long and it was a high level coming together with memorandums of understanding that l allowed them to police jointly without having to worry when they were in the field who was their commander and you, as you can imagine all the different disclaimers mm -hmm. and legal things. And so they were working together and it, you, you didn't in a case like that necessarily know who had, if you will, in a room this size, as I envisioned it and saw it from pictures, every, about every inch there was a hole cut in the carpet so that it looked like Swiss cheese. And that was true of everything in their house. Every, because remember that that was one of the first cases in the country that hinged on fiber evidence. Right. And so they had to get fiber from everywhere. They had done that to their car seats, to their floor mats, and anything that they thought 
could support this kind of burgeoning law of uh, fiber evidence. And I hadn't thought of it. I knew from sitting in on the police descriptions that they were going to have to do a real thorough job. But it wasn't until that claim came that I looked at it and thought, horrible, horrible. And it was very um, frustrating because <clears throat> the law in Georgia did not permit me to pay a claim like that. Mm -hmm. The municipal law in Georgia, as you could imagine, how quickly a city could go bankrupt if the converse were true, if you could, in fact, if you did, in fact, have to pay all those claims. And it always seemed to balance, it always seemed to balance out, you know, that there were so many that were not, were not meritorious. And I had come up with a couple of ways to do some, uh, to advise some lawyers that they might proceed when there were, I thought, meritorious claims that we could, in a sense, get around, if you will. And I, I took the matter to your, um, to, to the, to uh, Andrew Young. And he said, we can't pay anything for this. And I said, no, we will not be able to pay this. And he said to me, well, think about a way that we might be able to do something. And then it occurred to me that in a, nothing of that magnitude, but another situation that just the equities, if you will, mm -hmm. I thought overrule, overruled municipal law. Mm -hmm. And I was able to tell um, a lawyer that I could perhaps settle a lawsuit, mm -hmm. but I was not able to handle this as a claim. Mm -hmm. And so I was, Mayor Young asked me to meet with him in a day or two and tell him if I thought there was any way we could do it. And you know, you know his his way of, of having a a good soul soul fest, if you will, was to do gumbo. Mm -hmm. So I could, being a you know, any time wanting his gumbo. We went over and I said, I think I have it. And he said, Marva, do you mean to tell me if we play exactly by the book that there is no way to give Homer Williams? And he had, he had so personal, I, I'm not sure yet, but I think he might have even known him because mm -hmm. he was a fairly well-known person about mm -hmm. town. And he, there were times when public policy, just as he told me when I was going out to fight that case, that that was man's law. But he was in a higher in a higher plane, going to be loving that person in the morning. There were in in the in the issues that I dealt with the mayor on. There was constantly the intersecting, if you will, of religious moral matters and where the law stopped and did not allow us to do things. But. The mayor's charge was always to figure out a way, if there's any possible way, to make that happen. And I don't say this um, for any reason to, than to say that the, a, a person on the city council understood it and we were able to get, get it resolved as a settlement of a lawsuit. But the way that law was written, you know, you, I mean, who could not want Wayne Williams' mother's rug repaired. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, ha absolutely innocent victim. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of times when Georgia law of municipal corporations is pretty stringent. And uh, another perfect illustration of it was the mayor's desire to want to help um, President Carter with the um, presidential do we eventually call it Presidential Parkway? Freedom Parkway. Freedom Parkway. We couldn't call it. Park. Neighborhoods what? wouldn't let us call oh, it. It couldn't be presidential. <laughs> we got killed for presidential. Um, and everything in the world, all the equities were on the side of the Carter people about giving um, parkland to them. Mm -hmm. And the law in Georgia as written, we had to change the law, but as written would not allow us to abandon the use of a park, of land as a park, and put it to another public use, you could abandon it. No, you had to abandon it for another public use. You could not abandon it for a private use. And the Carter Center was still a private use. It was not, you know, although it's a public figure that is privately owned mm -hmm. land, it's a private project. Um, so we had to go around it by making the law, by changing the law on that. And the mayor felt so strongly about that, he told me, well, he would just sign the deeds because he thought that, that the law was wrong. And I said, the law <laughs> is wrong, but we're not going to be able just to sign the deeds. 
we'll probably have to change the, change the law. So it had to be sta change at the state level? Yeah, yeah, in order to make that donation of that land possible. But I think among, and I have the three lawyers, the three mayors, I guess, to compare, that I've encountered those areas where being a minister and a mayor created more dilemmas maybe than they they would for someone who did not also operate on that plane. That's what that's what you were you were getting at. I don't know that any commented on. No, no. Well, it's an interesting perspective. I always think that lawyers bring the best analysis. <laughs> 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 well, you know, well, we should. Well, well, actually, you know, there's a has, has been a dual degree of law and of public policy and ministry mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. the Andrew Young School, and I think probably need to do this. This needs to be a course. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't say this to 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 be different from everybody because we were one happy team, but there are so many things that I would deal with as a lawyer that no one else at the table. Mm -hmm. Dealt with. I guess that's why I was the city attorney and they were the fire chief, right? I mean, they were doing things I wasn't doing. But um, yeah, but that I think brought me into closer jurisprudential, moral discussions with Mayor Young as a mayor than anybody else. Because he often asked why. And I always, being a fellow traveler essentially, <laughs> always was there with him and understood that. The mayor, you talk about doing things in a different way. He announced in his first cabinet meeting that he was going to seek to find us where we worked. And I wondered, now what is that going to mean? Or maybe the second cabinet meeting. And that translated meant, instead of us sitting around here like this, I'm going to ride around with the parks commissioner to different parks. I'm going to ride around in police cruisers. I'm going to ride in the fire truck. I'm going to go over to the airport and walk around. And I wonder now, what is that going to mean for me as the city attorney? Where are I? And it meant my departmental meeting with you as the head of that department. The mayor decided that he and his wife had um, played tennis with my husband and me. He said, you're pretty athletic. Do you swim too? And I said, I do. And he said, well, our meetings are going to be in the swimming pool at the Atlanta Downtown Athletic Club. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then I realized the reason that he wanted the meetings in the pool was that I couldn't bring any papers. <laughs> the first couple of times he came to my office, I had cases stacked up like this. Just take them off. This case means this. This case means that. And I found, and these, this is where we had, and it happened, and this is where we would have these very serious discussions about morality and legality and where these issues were in conflict and why I should go out and seek to change the law if I had to. And I couldn't have any cases with me, only those I remembered. You know, the crying needs for these cases. Can I get your authority to settle this or that? But otherwise, we spent time in the swimming pool. And the first morning that that happened, I met a girlfriend in the ladies' room, the change room, and she said, I'm paying your salary and you're down here swimming in the morning? And I said, I'm at a cabinet meeting. <laughs> and she said, oh, yeah, like, you know, I'm going to buy a bridge in Brooklyn, too, you know. So she goes out before me, and she comes shrieking back into the ladies' room, and she says, are you serious? She said, Andy Young says he's out there waiting for you. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm having my cabinet meeting. <laughs> and I would run into people like that periodically. But they didn't understand that we got so much done because we would swim and talk. And he's a very good swimmer, and I'm a very good swimmer. And we would swim and talk about these things, and I'd always leave with a different take on which cases should be settled, <laughs> what laws I ought to attempt to change at the state level, what ordinances he didn't think had, were fundamentally founded on the right principles, and we wound up um, really having some extremely interesting conversations. Uh, I would say different from any other mayor and any city attorney ever. <laughs> 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 That's
<laughs> that would be pretty different. That would be pretty different. Well, yeah. We, we know, well, now we know why he loved being mayor so much. Oh yes, we had. He had a good. He enjoyed it. <laughs> he enjoyed it. Um, he would see me coming and coming and just think of all these different things he had been piling up to ask me. You know why? Why if? In fact, man is this, and we had these philosophical discussions. And the people in my office would be standing, staying back at the office. My office was over in the Omni across from Ted Turner's. And I'd be with the mayor so long, they'd be standing there waiting for me to sign briefs or read something. And they were saying, what took you so long? You said an hour, and it was three hours. I said, I had to leave. We weren't finished. I just had to leave. <laughs> So we had we really had uh, very interesting discussions, and um, they they benefited me greatly when I became a corporate lawyer because I could pose those things to my clients mm. now as well. Mm. You were talking about uh, some of the questions I saw, wh what was going on behind the scenes, and who the leaders were. Ugh. Yeah, because I think one of the things that about the Atlanta way. You know, you keep touching on it. There's always this, there's this informal way of solving problems. You know, there's sort of what happens in the public view, but that's not really where the conflict gets resolved. So, I mean, who would you say were some of the critical, the sort of really important people who were able to? I would say, and your dad mentioned, your dad mentioned two of them. I, I would say that your father's um, administration and you know the young administration might have been a very different animal if Charles Loudermilk, and I know that doesn't surprise you if you talk to as many people as you have, who understood the mayor. Was very fond of them, of him and was a fellow traveler and completely supported his agenda. It was never that he got people together for them to talk the mayor out or down off of a, a position. He supported it. But he also knew that you could make these pronouncements, but you couldn't govern without the key leaders being behind you. And so Charles Loudermilk was always the one who recognized what it was the mayor wanted, what his achievements intended to be in his you know, blueprint for his administration. But he was the one who was, in my opinion, genius about identifying the people in the Atlanta business community who were the ones who had to be at the table for the achievement of various goals. And so they didn't always turn out to be the same people. He understood the administration. He understood the point in the the political development of African American leadership that Andrew Young found himself in, mm -hmm. and he knew this city and its leaders extremely well. He was a master at identifying exactly the right people to have at the different um, junctures, mm -hmm. if you will, at the, as the different issues that, while publicly appeared to be going one way, Underneath, these were the people you needed to have this done. Now the zoo, all right, there are animals dying. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do this this way. Underground Atlanta, that's a different set of people. Pursuing the Olympics, getting people with you, a different set of lawyers. So he was, and I'm not saying that Andrew Young didn't have his own um, list of people who he could recommend, but he would recommend certain people, and Charles Laudermilk would recommend others who were just, mm -hmm. and they were relatively unknown to me and most people in the black community. Mm -hmm. So that was an extremely beneficial um, teammate for us to have, and we really felt as though Charles Laudermilk was a team was a teammate mm -hmm. of ours. Um, Roberto, Roberto Goizueta, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of people who were senior partners at some of the major firms, mm -hmm. um, as. Mayor Young just reminded me when I came in, the first law firm to work in his first political campaign was the law firm that I wound up choosing to be the place I would transition from the public sector to the private sector. And there were a couple of other law firms like that whose leaders were still in place. Um, so those were, those were very, and, and then of course, the, the people that you're, um, 
that Mayor Young knew from the black community. He was also just as adept as Charles Laudermilk was in knowing exactly which people from the black community would be the ideal people to have at the table for the talk that had to be done to make a public issue achievable. So they were they were masters together. It was really quite a joy to watch mm. to watch that happen. Well, I know Jesse Hill was one of the early morning phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Hill, my goodness, unbelievable! Uh, the role that he played behind the scene in making so many things happen. He, I would say was almost the counterpart of Charles Laudermilk in the African-American community, mm -hmm. unfailing in his support and devotion to the young administration. There was never any time I felt that we're stuck on a point and now people need to talk where I would call Jesse Hill and not find him full of ideas I hadn't thought of, full of the willingness to go farther than even I had asked, saying, let's not have two meetings tomorrow, let's have four, <laughs> and I'll do this too, of that and this meeting and that. So th those people who were, and um, the loyalty that they had for Mayor Young because they believed in him and in his um, philosophy that there's more that unites us. We have more common ground than we do things that separate us. Anyone who was identifying people to come to a meeting, and especially if the mayor himself would be there, knew that they would get a fair hearing, there weren't going to be sharpened knives and axes drawn, there was going to be an attempt to try to identify the common ground. And because of that, everyone I ever asked to come to a meeting was more than willing because that was the reputation that Andrew Young had. And it made life so much easier for all of his cabinet members in innumerable ways because that was kind of the guiding light of the of the administration and as I say there were one thing I think a lot of people don't know about Mayor Young and I think I know this is that he loves the sport of politics when it comes to vote counting <laughs> nothing pleased him more and to go out around the world and to come back, and, and as you well know, the ever-present index card in the vest pocket. He would pull out the index card and say, to me particularly, and to Shirley, he loved to have these discussions with us, guess where I think our votes are now for the Olympics? And he would say, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast to you. <laughs> <laughs> A Mombasa, I mean, someplace, some you know, some Pacific Atoll or something. And he loved the counting of that. And the, the sport of, the, I think this city might get this one, but I think I have that. And he put it back in, and then another couple of weeks, he'd take it out. So the counting of votes for the winning of the Olympics, for anyone who believes that um, Andy Young was the mayor, the world was just going to fall into place, and they just voted for him because they liked Andy Young. Now, there's an awful lot of truth to that. He wouldn't have even had an audience with those people had he not known them from a youth involved in Christian camp activities. A Howard University student who met a lot of people on it. Well, they were international students, and at every point along the way of his life, it was the perfect coming together of all of his talents to be brought to the effort of the Olympics. But he loved the vote counting too. And there was more than just they're going to come in the room and do this because they know Andy Young. And because he knew these people so well, he knew how to get their votes and how to talk to them. Billy Payne and all the rest of them and ten of each of them put together could never have won the Atlanta Olympics if Andy had not been out counting the votes and getting the votes. I guess you call that the whip. Is that the whip's mm -hmm. job in the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. the vote counter? He was the whip for the Olympics because yeah. he knew where the votes were. And of course, when, we, when he won and came back and saw me, he took this well-worn thing out and absolutely every one of those countries, that's where our votes were. Hmm. And I said, hmm. you're right. Hmm. That's exactly where the votes were. Hmm. They said Obama doesn't have. The sport of it, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I 
think he's not engaged in the sport of politics, the trading of votes, the what people want, whether yeah. you can really meet them. Right. And of course, a lot of people make propositions for their votes that are just untenable. There's right. no way, you will never have their vote right. because you cannot do that. Right. But there's a sport involved. Right. And if you don't like it, I think right. it really alters your. And also, somebody should have told him you can't get votes without your marks. You don't want to give up earmarks and they're if you're trying to pass legislation. You don't want to do that, and especially for your whip. Your whip might want to tell them, I can't get that vote. And, and then a if lot I of people... I can't promise them that intersection. And then, <laughs> as, as, as Mayor Young fun. used to say, I'll call him. And I would say, Andy, that's now eight people you have on that list. Oh, it won't take long. He said, all they really want to do is just to be able to say that the mayor called me. Mm -hmm. He said, it'll take about two or three or four minutes. I won't rush them off the phone. But they don't really want to talk to me about very much, except they will say, I voted for that because the mayor called. Right. Right. And I mean, he really mastered it because mm -hmm. he taught me so much mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that, the, mm -hmm. those aspects of being the mayor, your, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mayor Young was just an absolute ex expert at. And most people don't associate those with Andy Young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't know that he loves the counting and the sport of it all, and you know, talking to people about their votes. Um, well, this has been so great. I'm thinking. You, I hope you're writing your memoirs. <laughs> people need to. <laughs> I think. That Should I put I in think, the day the mayor got sick on me and left me with a room full of people? Yeah, absolutely. And I have. Um, I, I had the privilege of speaking for um, Gabois for the installation of the new office. Yes, yes. And I, I looked up there and I said, now when I, I can't remember, they have more black women on their executive board than there were black women attorneys when I passed the bar. It was unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The, I call them kids. But all of them would buy your book, <laughs> is my point. <laughs> And could really benefit from it. <laughs> they, they, they think they've got it tough. <laughs> it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. <laughs> Where do you think we are now in the Atlanta way, cities, governance, policy? I think the Atlanta way had some tearing in its fabric, I would say, um, of... Um, the administration that preceded the Franklin administration, I think did damage. And among the many difficulties that Shirley Franklin had when she inherited a city that had been governed in a way for eight years that almost led to bankrupt its bankruptcy, was to mend things with the movers and shakers in Atlanta and return us to our guiding force being the Atlanta way. I, I think um, even though the background of Mayor Campbell would have led you to believe that he was ideally born, bred, and almost just heaven sent to be the mayor at the time he was, mm -hmm. that wound up not being true of his administration. I, I think the the way that um, painstakingly the city hall role in achieving the Atlanta way was set back. And perhaps as it seems maybe serendipity in a way that he was followed by Mayor Franklin who had sat at the feet of two of the best ever in doing that could be the one to repair that. And so I think we are now in flight again. And having been having benefited from her, um, I see the current mayor as being a disciple of that. And I'm 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 very pleased with where I think uh, where I think that approach to governance and public private alliances rests in the city right now. Fifteen or twenty years ago, however long ago that was, I was pretty pessimistic about that. But I think we're headed headed in the right direction and have a lot of big things to achieve, and we can we can with uh, people coming together. I, I it it always just strikes me when I talk to people from other cities, all the progress we've made in Atlanta, that our description of how we 
got there is so foreign to them. It is truly, when I first heard it in Atlanta way, and I thought, this is just, you know, a lot of boosterism and chamber of commerce, blue sky, yada, yada, yada kind of thing. And I don't, I, they're, they're, as, as a lot of colleagues of Shirley Franklin and I have told us in our Olympic endeavors, it is real, it is alive, it is functioning, and it is not in every city. There just is not that. And I won't say people in Atlanta love Atlanta more than many other cities, but I think it's close. <laughs> I think it's close. The, when you sit in a room full of hard-nosed police officers who are wanting to almost shoot each other, but at the end of the day, they are inspired by the fact, yeah, we do love the city more than we hate each other. And I think we are just almost blessed with lots of people that we can attribute this to. Because I think Henry Grady, going back to some of the people who were um, even a generation or so older than Maynard Jackson. And I found when I was the one to have to give the bad news to a lot of people about Maynard Jackson's minority participation program, that my takeaway was how many people there were who were really quite willing to do that who did believe that this was, an, this was an idea whose time had come, if it was going to be done fairly and competitively and not just as giveaways to your best friend, mm -hmm. that there were people who, who, who very much believed that um, it is an idea whose time has come and they were willing to support it. Now, a lot of times they, their bosses, if they were lawyers or if they were principals in companies, they might not be necessarily telling the mayor that. I mean, it was, you know, it was behind the scenes. There was one thing, and there was kind of a public fight. But yeah, I think we're. I think we're back. I, I'm, I think we're we're where we should be at this point again in time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With you know different generations of people involved. I think, and the fact is, I read in, in the handout to me, the attachment to the email that some people in Leadership Atlanta are so interested in this is just a wonderful thing because the mayors did go to Leadership Atlanta and if you will preach the gospel that was where the choirs got trained and so forth so it's just really wonderful to know that people are interested and want to continue that. When I was looking here at my role in things I did work with mayors uh, Jackson Young and, and Franklin of course and I think I told you about the Atlanta Midfield Project and the 1996 Olympics. Whew, 1996 Olympics mm -hmm. were, it was just amazing. I went out of the country with Billy Payne the first time he ever left the city, the country. It was the first time he had ever left? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were on the plane and they gave, the, the stewardess gave us, you know, the declaration form that you fill out because we're going to another country. And Billy said, what is this? And I said, boy, you got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. And nobody is a better illustration of having been exposed to Andy Young and what it really meant. And Billy Payne came very hostile to the idea of... Um, Diversity, I'll say. And then at the end of the day, I hear him now on television programs and things talking about our greatest achievements in the Olympics. <laughs> and all Atlantans working of all faiths and all colors, number one, <laughs> number one on his list. Of all, I mean, he really drank the Kool-Aid, I'd have to say. <laughs> it was very effective. <laughs> One thing I'd like for you to step back from your personal experience and say just a bit more about and the role of Maynard Jackson attracting people of talent like you who were non-Atlantans who came here to be a part of something special. Well, in, in retrospect, now, you know, 20, 30 years later, I, I'm r really pretty much in awe of it, actually. 
it while you're doing it, you you you, you know you just get so caught up in all the hoopla of the day, the clamor of the moment. But as other friends at Hilton Head or someplace have said to me, who, who all was in the cabinet with you or who were the people who worked for Maynard Jackson? It really is, it, it really is quite amazing because there is remaining still in Atlanta maybe 20 people who when we're asked how long have you been in Atlanta, we all say the same year mm -hmm. because everybody came mm -hmm. in about 1973, 1974. And if you could join the administration after it was a year or so, uh, functioning a year or so, maybe 75, 73, 74, 75. It's just an amazing period of time. Many of the people, I, I guess in a way I was lucky because I'm not sure with where our lives were going in, in New York that I would have looked at Jet Magazine or Ebony or heard something at an NAACP meeting or something. I'm not sure I would have been caught up and thought, I should uproot everything and go. And for one reason, I was married, we had children, and so it was not, it would have been, it was a little more in, of an entanglement for me, you know, to disengage that life and take off to another place. But there were people coming right out of law school, right out of uh, graduate school, the school of urban studies or something. And many of them were literally looking, <laughs> literally, they would say, looking at um, a jet magazine or in Ebony, seeing an article about Maynard, or hearing him come to their church speak, and they were about to graduate in a year or two, and deciding, I think I'm going to go there. <laughs> and he preached the gospel of what it was he was going to do in Atlanta so convincingly that people who could have had very bright careers and who were being urged by professors and people, stay here, go there, take your career here, who were given job offers other places, picked up right after school or after a year working someplace, and all came together. He, and then, I mean, the, the resumes that used to come in from people who wanted to be part of the Jackson administration, just astounding. Um, so he really did a tremendous job on selling the idea that Atlanta was, as he used to say, open for business. Um, and he just had a larger than life personality. And many people were at the point where they have been lucky enough now to go to some really fine schools. Schools had opened their doors. And so it was the coming together. Pretty if you recently. Look at, pretty recently, yeah. yeah. The coming together, if you will, of several currents that all happened at the same time. And Mayor Young always says that the fortunes of Atlanta were really built on two things, integration and air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so I have to factor in that Maynard Jackson, had he been the city, had he been the mayor of a city that wasn't integrated or not air conditioned, Mayor Young's probably right. <laughs> but the time was right. Atlanta was now a city that had a great attraction. A lot of people, as is true in my case, had um, um, family connections in Atlanta or Georgia. My family's from Thomasville, Georgia, originally. Where you were born. Where I was born. Mm -hmm. Where you were born. Mm -hmm. Your um, Mayor Young was the minister three times removed from my uncle, who was the minister in the same church. Bethany uh -huh. Congregational. Yep, church. Bethany Congregational. And so, um, you know, I have roots. Mm -hmm. But the the amazing thing is how many people we could have, and we a lot of us socialized because we were new to Atlanta, and we were making our friendships and our professional lives all at the same time. And we could be together at someone's house and look around the table, and there wouldn't be one person from the same city. Hmm. Seattle, hmm. San Antonio, San Francisco, just everywhere. The reach was nation, truly nationwide. Hmm. And of course, it's not hard either when you have a man who's out offering people jobs and he isn't even the mayor yet. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow or other seeming serious enough that you almost took it seriously. But yeah, that was a, that was a tremendous part of it. I wish Maynard had lived to see what the new census reveals about the huge change in Atlanta that for the first time in 2010, there are now more African Americans, a majority of Amer African Americans live in the South again mm -hmm. for the first time since 1910. Mm -hmm. And Atlanta has supplanted, I think, Chicago as the number two metropolitan area for the concentration of African Americans. Hmm. First time. Hmm. And the 
and um, in the number or percentage or something of black businesses. Black oh, black businesses. incredible numbers. How much head and shoulders it is above mm -hmm. all the other cities. I mean, when you look at yeah, the density. The, the people who have just come, and there have been articles in the New York Times, a series of, if you will, probably inspired by that great book by Isabel Wilkerson mm -hmm. on the warmth of other suns. Mm -hmm. How people and, and I'm a, I'm an example of that. I'm a child of the Great Migration. My mother and father were both from, from a, the Jones family from Alabama, and I've always assumed that I'm related to Adela your Jones. Child. Yeah, I'm somehow <laughs> other related to you, your Joneses. Mm -hmm. Deep Alabama, deep uh, Georgia, and so there was in many of us who were the first generation born in the North. This is our home. This is our. This is as close as we can come to ancestral home. Mm -hmm. And so when integration and air conditioning came, people wanted to come back to something familiar. I spent every summer here and every other Christmas, mm -hmm. even though I was growing up in a small town outside of uh, Pittsburgh. And I, I, I think it might come close to overstating the case, but I'll say it anyway. I think Maynard Jackson and Andrew Young and what they did with Atlanta, making it truly a mecca for the best and the brightest, is absolutely reflected in those um, the census, those decennial mm -hmm. census numbers. You can't go anywhere without at a dinner party on a place like Hilton Head or St. Simons without saying, "Oh yeah, my nephew just moved to Atlanta." <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody it's they they preach the gospel of Atlanta in a way that the choir the choir and the congregation really. It's it's wonderful because it, it has a steady stream of very talented people. And I think that's definitely true, not only of the black community, but you know, our schools of higher learning who keep a lot of them like the city and they stay and it becomes, you know, a building of better and better, better talent all the time. It's been wonderful to watch. This has been wonderful. Well, thank you. We really thank you. I don't know if you got any questions, Ann. You know, I we did, well, we, 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 we love it when we don't have to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I, when I see your dad, and he makes me think, well, tell them from my first day in office. You know, and so you can start with that. We have him sit down with us occasionally. We just turn the oh, machines on and he starts. you got to. But, that's, but yeah. you see, that's why we don't have him in on the interviews. Because he won't let the other people talk. So and that, together. That's why we have to do them separately. <laughs> but we will, you know, there'll be, you know, so we, 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 we try, to, I've learned from experience that, you know, it'll be five hours and I might have one hour of the, of the first the subject we're trying to interview. So that's, that's sort of why we, we do it this way. But it, this has really it's been phenomenal. that he remembers is yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, in fact, I need to tell him this. Mm -hmm. I was at your house uh -oh. the night that, um, the morning, might have been two mornings, after Evander Holyfield won the first championship. And who would he have, I mean, who would fate put him on a plane sitting next to? Because you win the championship, you go on Letterman, you go on this, you know, to increase your marketability, and then you come home. Who's he on the plane with as he's coming home? Who's he sitting next to? Andrew Young. Huh. What does Andrew Young tell him? I've just gone into private practice. He tells uh, Evander Holyfield that I'm, I must be his lawyer hmm. and I'm meeting with him at the house that night at your house so in the middle of it he says oh um, I just told Evander uh, Holyfield that uh, you need to he needs to be your lawyer let me go call him <laughs> I'm thinking what he gets up he goes he calls the business manager at the hotel. He knew he was at the hotel. And a, a little piece you got to remember here is that he was separated from his wife, so he was not staying at home. He had told Andy he was at a hotel. Andy goes, he gets the general manager. They even go and knock on the door. He's not there. And the long and short of that is, I said, Andy, why do you think I should be his lawyer? I knew this was going to be good. And he said, because he has a very bad image right now, and he doesn't look good in this dispute and so forth with his wife, and he needs a fine, young, female, black lawyer to represent him. So the next day, Evander Holyfield calls me up, and he says, I want you to be my lawyer. I said, I know. And he said, how do you know? I said, Andy Young. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. 
what having been Andy Young's lawyer has led to in my life. And of course, it was so much fun. And your mother told me if I ever left him in those eight years, she'd never speak to me again. And I said, well, we're related, Joneses, so I got I to gotta do this. And just like I walk in today and he says, will you please see about Jesse right. Hills? Right, 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 right. You all have a wonderful job. I hope it isn't a job because it sounds like true fun. This should be done. We are enjoying it. Yeah. I, at least I am. Yeah, no, this is great. This is, I mean, well, it's like I, you know, as I said, this is uh, of all, the all the things I'm doing at the foundation. This is the part I do for fun. Oh, it has to be.